Welcome to our Mary Greeley Primetime Alive presentation, Glaucoma and its New Treatments. I am Vicki Newell, and I manage the Primetime Alive program here at Mary Greeley Medical Center. As a reminder, if you want more information about Primetime Alive or to sign up for an upcoming program, you can go to mgmc.org slash PTA. Our presenter today is Dr. Nicholas Hamouche, who is a frequent flyer with us. We always thank him for being willing to come back. Dr. Hamouche received his bachelor's and medical degree from the American University of Beirut and completed a residency in ophthalmology from George Washington University and fellowships in glaucoma at both the University of Kentucky and Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA. He joined McFarland Clinic's ophthalmology department in 2001. Please welcome Dr. Hamoush. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there isn't much new in glaucoma. The weather is perfect. Why, should, why don't we just call it quits and go out and enjoy the weather? Who agrees? No? Okay. So uh, I think I've given a similar or this talk before. Anybody remembers this talk before about glaucoma? So we'll go over what is glaucoma, what are the basic treatment options and uh, some new options and then whatever questions you have, we'll try to answer them. I'll try to answer them. <clears throat> so um, just to begin, a, a, a basic review of the eye anatomy. So obviously that's the eye, the cornea is here, that's the lens. Whenever there is cataract and we do cataract surgery, this is the thing we, we remove. And this is the optic nerve here and the retina is on the back surface here, okay? Now for the eye to function properly, it needs a certain eye pressure. So think of it as a tire or a balloon. So if, if, if the pressure is too low and things are deflated, the eye will not function. Oops. All right. So, so if, if the pressure is too low and the eye is deflated, so things will not work properly. So vision will be blurry. On the other hand, if the pressure is too high, then there is more stress on the retina and the optic nerve, and that can cause glaucoma, okay? So you need, we need a normal range of pressure. Too low is not good, too high is glaucoma, okay? Um, so what keeps the eye pressure within this normal range? It's the fluid that is secreted in the eye here behind the iris, so that's the iris. Behind the iris here, there is what we call the ciliary body, and there is a fluid that is secreted and goes through the pupil, turns around, and goes out through what we call the trabecular meshwork. This is, it's like a sponge, a filter. So the, the aqueous fluid goes through that filter and goes through the system and out of the eye, okay? So if it is working properly, if the system is working properly, we have a normal pressure of around 10 to 20, 22 millimeters mercury. This is how we measure the pressure. If this filter here, the sponge doesn't work properly and there is no drainage, then the pressure goes up. And that is the problem. Again, that's similar, just a little bit more details about the optic nerve here. You see, obviously, there are blood vessels, the red and the blue, and there are some nerve tissue here. So imagine putting pressure on this, the blood vessels will occlude, there isn't enough blood flowing, and there is damage. So basically, this is what's happening in glaucoma, okay? You lose the retinal cells because of the high pressure. You lose the retinal nerve fibers because of the high pressure. And then things start showing on the optic nerve and then the visual field will deteriorate, the vision. So by the time people notice a change in the vision, that's pretty advanced 
because you can we can lose a lot of retinal cells or retinal tissues without any changes in our vision or visual field. So this is why we like to catch the disease as early as possible. If we wait until people come and say, oh, I'm starting to feel that I don't see on the side, that's already very advanced glaucoma, okay? Some numbers, these are uh, older numbers. I think things are a little bit worse. Um, in general, in the U.S. population, about 2% of the population have glaucoma. Uh, probably 50% of the people with glaucoma don't even know they have it because it is a silent disease, okay? There is no pain, no redness. And as we said, the vision will not change until it is very advanced. So that's why it is important to have regular exams, regular screenings, check the pressure, look at the optic nerve, and whenever there is suspicion, then we dig deeper. So half of the people with glaucoma don't even know it, and we have about 80,000 people blind uh, with glaucoma. And this is, this is mainly U.S. population. The same numbers apply to the, to, to, to the rest of the world, and even worse, in underdeveloped countries, screening, routine eye exams is even worse. So you can imagine more people are going with glaucoma and don't know. So different types of glaucoma. Uh, this is the um, more common type of glaucoma that a Caucasian population like ours here can, uh, is expected to deal with. It's called primary open angle glaucoma. So the, the anatomy, if you remember the first slide, the angle is open. Anatomically, it is open, but it, it's not working properly. This is in contradistinction to closed angle, where the anatomy is closed. If we look, we don't even see those drainage channels. So that's a different type of glaucoma, much more common in China, for example. Uh, congenital glaucoma, very rare, uh, more common in societies with a lot of intermarriages, uh, common in a society like Saudi Arabia, for example. So kid, babies can be born with high pressure and glaucoma. So congenital, sometimes glaucoma shows up early in life, not at birth, but teenage we call it childhood or, or juvenile glaucoma, so uh, genetic factors there. Secondary glaucoma is, for example, somebody on chronic steroid treatment, prednisone, for whatever reason, rheumatoid arthritis, some inflammatory disease. So, for example, prednisone can, can cause elevation of the intraocular pressure. This is an example of a secondary look. Another example, somebody who gets a trauma to the eye. That damages the drainage channels. You get a secondary glaucoma. So different types of glaucoma. But for all practical purposes, we are going to be talking primarily about primary open angle glaucoma. What are the people that are at risk? Obviously... We will see in a different slide, the older, the higher the risk. Uh, African-American have a higher risk of developing glaucoma. They develop it early in, earlier in age, earlier in life, and it is usually more severe because of some other factors. Uh, as we said, if you have elevated intraocular pressure, IOP is intraocular pressure, eye pressure. So the higher the pressure, the higher the risk which means some people can have glaucoma with a normal pressure. So you measure the pressure and it is 15, which is very normal. You look at the optic nerve, oops, it looks suspicious. So there is a variant called normal pressure glaucoma or low pressure, low tension glaucoma. So Checking for glaucoma is not enough to go and check the eye pressure because the eye pressure can be normal and the patient can have glaucoma. It's very important to look at the 
rest of the picture, the optic nerve and some other tests, okay? First degree relatives with glaucoma. So somebody in the family has glaucoma. First degree kids, brothers, sisters, their risk is 10 times higher than the average population. So every time I diagnose a patient with glaucoma or I meet a patient with glaucoma for the first time, I always tell them to advise their kids, brothers, sisters to go and have a good eye exam because their risk of the disease is higher. Uh, high myopia, diabetes, these are other risk factors uh, for developing glaucoma. Um, so this is the, 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 the prevalence of glaucoma as we relate it to eye pressure. So here we have eye pressure here and the risk percentage of glaucoma here. So as we said, normal eye pressure, we consider it somewhere between 10 and 20, 22. You can notice, like, even in a Caucasian population, at 22 pressure, the risk of glaucoma is not zero. So some of these people with pressure of 22 or below have, have some glaucoma, 1%, 2%. But obviously, as the pressure goes up, the risk goes up. Okay, so you go to pressure above 30, and now you have 5 6% risk. African Americans, as we said, for the same pressures, they are at a higher risk. Because of other associated things, they have more diabetes, more hypertension, more different eye anatomy, and so, uh, so the higher the pressure, the higher the risk. And this is why the treatment for glaucoma, the only treatment we have for glaucoma actually is to lower the eye pressure. So somebody comes with a pressure of 30 and we drop it to a pressure of 20, the risk of things progressing becomes much less. So <clears throat> uh, we said the older, the higher the risk. And here is the, the correlation, again, in a Caucasian population. African-Americans will have a, slide, the, a, a graph that goes like this here. And again, the older we are, the higher the risk of glaucoma. So somebody in the 80s, again, risk is 5% versus 1% or 2% if you are below 60, 65 so older age is a higher risk for, for developing glaucoma. How, we, how do we diagnose? What do we look at when somebody comes and we are checking for glaucoma? So first thing is we, after checking the, the, the eye exam, the vision, slit lamp, and eye pressure, of course, we always take the eye pressure, we look at the optic nerve. So we are looking at the optic nerve uh, with, with an ophthalmoscope or a special lens. And typically this is what you want to see is a healthy optic nerve. This is the nerve. These are the retinal vessels. This is the retinal artery. This is the retinal vein. And I don't know if you can tell there is a yellowish circle here, right? That's that's called the cup. It's actually a depression. So we look at that ratio between the cup to the nerve. We want a cup to disc ratio. In this case, it's about 0 0.3. So, so the cup is about 30% of the nerve, and this is very healthy. The tissue around is very healthy, no hemorrhages. So that's a perfectly normal optic nerve. Now, if we see something like this, that's practically glaucoma by definition, okay? You see this hemorrhage here? That's called a Drance hemorrhage. We see it in glaucoma, and now you see the cup. How big compared to the nerve? So this is 
I would say it's a cup to this ratio of around 0 0.8. And here, maybe you don't see it, but there is a notch. So that's, that's a glaucomatous optic nerve. So I see this. This is glaucoma regardless of the eye pressure. Even if the pressure is 12, this patient has glaucoma, okay? Now, after we look at the nerve, we have other things to check now. This is a, uh, an OCT picture, optical coherence tomography, OCT. This is a technology probably 15 years old, keeps on improving. So what, what do we do with this is we, it's not very clear here, but this is the optic nerve here and we are measuring the retinal thickness around it, okay? So the optic nerve is a circle. We measure this, the retinal thickness around it, and then we open and we put it on a line, on a straight line. And so the black line is the thickness of the patient, you see? It is within the green range. So this patient has a normal retinal thickness. That's very good. You go to the yellow or the red, it means your retina is getting thinner, which means we need to treat, lower the eye pressure. So that's a very common test we do for glaucoma, the OCT test. After looking, we get the, the, the OCT picture. The third test, that everybody loves. I, I haven't seen any of my patients that hates this test. It's called the visual field exam. Now, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> I haven't seen a patient that doesn't complain about this test. So basically, the patient is sitting and focusing on a target inside this ball. There is a ball here inside. And the machine is flashing lights in different areas of the visual field. And every time the patient sees the light, he, is he or she is supposed to press the button. And then the system knows that, okay, so now we can see this light here. The next time this light is, is projected here, the intensity is decreased. So the machine will keep on decreasing the intensity until the patient doesn't click the light. And then... At the end of the test, we have something like this. So this patient has very good sensitivity here. This is the left eye. Very good sensitivity here. But here we have lost some sensitivity, okay? So here the patient requires more light to see and press the button. And if you follow that patient over time, you see that that, that area is becoming worse and worse. It's getting bigger and bigger and darker and darker. So this is a progressive disease. So something needs to be done. Typically, you push the treatment further. Either you add medication or you do something else. Somebody looking can see something like this. The peripheral vision becomes constricted. And sometimes even in the center, and this is actually the view of the medical building across the street from Jules Stein Eye Institute. So Jules Stein Eye Institute is, is behind, and this is the... It's becoming ancient history now since I, since I was there. So our, our goal of treatment is to stabilize the vision and stop the damage. We cannot recover what is lost, okay? Whatever is lost for glaucoma is, until now at least, a lot of research is being done for uh, stem cells. And, but until now, the goal of our treatment is to stabilize things and stop the loss. And the only thing we can do is to lower the eye pressure. Again, there is work on things like neuroprotection, but so far we don't have a treatment. The only thing we, we, we do is lower the eye pressure. Even with treatment, sometimes things keep on progressing. So 
either we the pressure we set is not low enough. So somebody comes, pressure is 25. I say, okay, I want the pressure to be 18. We use whatever, and the pressure is 18. One year later, things are still going, getting worse. So 18 was not enough for that patient. Then I have to say, okay, now we need to push it to 16 or 15. So if there is progressive disease, e either the pressure is not low enough or the patient is not taking the medication. Very big problem in glaucoma. Or for that reason, other like systemic hypertension. Again, because there is no pain, it's a very slow disease, there is no redness, People just forget, don't use the eye drops. They say, oh, I'm not noticing a difference. It's a big problem. Uh, the same thing with, with hypertension. There is no pain until there is a stroke or there is an MI. So um, uh, fluctuation in the pressure. So during the day, the pressure goes through cycles and from day to day, the pressure. So whatever we are doing, if the visual field is not stable, if it is getting worse, it means we have to go to the next level, either more treatment or something else. After we use all the eye drops that we have, all the medical treatment that we have, and we still need to do something, what are our options? So now we are talking about laser trabeculoplasty, filtering surgery or trabeculectomy, drainage implant, and some other lasers. So we'll go a little bit. Uh, so the laser trabeculoplasty is actually a very, let me see what's this, okay. So, uh, trabeculoplasty is a very benign procedure that is done in the office. Uh, couple of problems, it does not work all the time, maybe 80% of the time, which means sometimes we do laser trabeculoplasty and nothing happens. So then we have to do something else. That's the main problem. It has been with us since the 60s and there is more evidence now that if we use it early in the treatment, even before starting eye drops, we might have better result. But 99% of the time when I have a patient and I say, look, we have glaucoma, we need to start treatment, I can give you an eye drop or I can do laser, 99% of the time it's eye drops. So for some reason, laser is, is scary, So, but we use it down the road. If that doesn't work, we go to trabeculectomy. If that doesn't work, we go to some implants, and this used to be the, the last uh, resort, cyclophotocoagulation. But things are changing, so we'll talk about some changes. Uh, so over the time, our treatments have been improving. So we started with pilocarpine in 1875, and you can see over time there are different surgeries. This is trabeculectomy in 68, and then Timolol in 70s, and then laser trabeculoplasty. Oh, I said the 60s, it was the 80s, huh? I thought it was 60s. So trabeculectomy was the 60s. And then uh, drainage implant. Uh, more recently, we are having things that we call MIGS, minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. Uh, we will talk about those, eye stent. And so we keep on improving treatment, either by me medical treatment or surgery. Uh, this is kind of a uh, algorithm we go through uh, Mrs. Jones, you have glaucoma. We can give you treatment or do laser. As I said, 99.9%. We'd start with treatment, eye drops. If it is not enough, we can either add or do the laser. And we go through this step two or three times until all the eye drops were not enough. Then we go to, to invasive surgery. 
And over the last few years, that has been the main change. So a few years ago, the, when we go to surgery, it used to be trabeculectomy. That was, it is still the gold standard, okay? If we want really low pressure, this is what we want to do. And the way to do it is to create a flap in the sclera, and under the flap, punch a hole in the eye. Uh, for some reason, so um, here you see, after we do that, the, we, put some, we put the flap back in place using some sutures. And we put the conjunctiva back in place. So now the fluid can go from the eye through that hole under the flap, under the conjunctiva. So it goes this way and under. So we, we create a bubble on the outside of the eyes. It sounds simple. It's not as simple to do. It is not as... Uh, uh, it comes with problems. Anytime we do such a surgery on the eye, hemorrhage, infection, retinal detachment, these things can happen. They are rare, but they can happen. Now, the bigger problem is healing and scarring. The, the, the eye tends to scar whatever you did and seal it, because for the eye, it, it doesn't differentiate. This is surgery, this is uh, a wound from trauma, okay? It ha all what it does is, okay, I need to close this and scar it. That's the bigger problem over time. These surgeries tend to uh, fail. There is a risk of infection. So, um, but it is still a good surgery, especially when we want very low pressure at the at, at advanced disease. The more advanced the disease, the lower the pressure. This is why it is better and safer to catch it early and use one of the less invasive procedures, uh, on the long run, it, it makes better sense, okay? But this is, this is something we still do. Until recently, as I said, now we have the minimally invasive procedure. So these are procedures that are, that, that are not as demanding, low risk, lower risk, I would say. It's, not, it's, it's never zero. But again, like in everything else in life, low risk, low reward. So they don't lower the pressure very, very much. So these are good early on in the disease. Because then if we drop the pressure to 15, 18, that might be enough. If you want the pressure 10 and 12, you need, these will not work. You need to do um, trabeculectomy, okay? Um, these include a laser cyclophotocorrelation. Uh, these are big names for different procedures, viscocanalostomy, canaloplasty, trabectome. These are all. Eye stent. So from, from these, I do eye stent and I do cyclophotocorrelation. Uh, the difference between all of these is not so great as far as result. These are pretty uh, straightforward to do, so I, I decided to start with these. And as things improve, we'll, we'll add different, uh, different uh, surgeries. So this is the eye stent. This is the older, this is the, or the original version. These are the newer version. You will see a small video, see how it works. Basically, this metallic kind of a button, we push it in the meshwork. You remember for, in, in early on we talked about the trabecular meshwork and the sponge that filters. So imagine if this is the problem and you puncture a, 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 puncture a hole in that, so now fluid can go faster. And this is basically what we do. The problem is if you puncture a hole with a laser, for example, the eye will scar it down and it seals within a few days. So putting, putting something like this in the hole keeps it open. So this is the basic concept. Again, it works, but not for advanced disease. And until recently, we couldn't do it except when we are doing cataract surgery. So it was approved 
to be added to a cataract surgery. But now the, new, the, the, the newest version, we can do it even without cataract surgery. So somebody who has just glaucoma, we want a couple of drops, a couple of millimeter decrease, his pressure 22, 23, we want it to go to 18. We can offer this without the complication of a trabeculectomy, okay? <coughs> Now, this is the video, and it is supposed to work, right? It's an infinite system. This is a 49-year-old African-American man with... Can you hear that? Is there a way to... So, so that's obviously the, the eye is prepped here. Lashes are covered. This is the speculum we use to keep the lids open during surgery. And you will see the, 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 the ophthalmologist making a couple of small incision here at the edge of the cornea, and then inject what we call a viscoelastic material so, so that the eye does not collapse every time he puts an instrument. So we inject something viscous, and then he will go and put the stents. He will put three of them, and... Um, it, it looks easy, it's not too complicated, but it's not as easy as, as it looks here. Can I go ahead? Um, I just want to tell you one thing quick. So people online, for some reason, you're not able to see the video online. We're going to play it here, but just know I will send out the recording of this program and you can watch the video when I send out the recording. But the volume should also be turned up now. All right, good. So let's go. Mild open angle glaucoma. He has a history of selective laser trabeculoplasty in the past and has multiple medication intolerances, leading to frequent medication noncompliance. His eye pressures hovered between 18 and 22 millimeters of mercury, and he was seeking surgical care for his glaucoma. You can see here, his, this patient is phacic. I use a 1.0 millimeter side port blade to create the main incision, and I widen it to about 1.5 millimeters, as well as flare the internal wound edges. After some intracameral lidocaine, a cohesive viscoelastic is used to form the anterior chamber. This is the viscoelastic here. Yeah. I also create a secondary one millimeter incision just in case I need it later during irrigation. Here I'm introducing the iStent Infinite device. So this is a contact lens we use to be able to see the angle and the trabecular meshwork. So the angle and the meshwork are here, okay? He will push and then put the stent somewhere here. And increasing my magnification to identify the tissue structures. That's the brownish line here. That's the trabecular meshwork. With the click of a button, the first stent is deployed, very similar to how you would use the iStent inject system. So that's the, that's the eye stent. So it went through the meshwork and it created the hole and it should keep that hole open because this stent will, will stay in place, okay? And he will do that twice more. At this point, you see my finger. What I'm doing here is pulling back on the singulator which releases the second stent to be ready for deployment. I click the button and the stent is very smoothly deployed through the trabecular meshwork. I'm now ready for the third stent and I again pull back on the singulator to release the third stent into the barrel and using the same click mechanism, the third stent is very smoothly released into the trabecular meshwork. A few things here you'll notice is number one is the quality and the clarity of, of visualization is better. That's because uh, we're not doing any fake emulsification uh, uh, prior to this. Second is, uh, because the wound is smaller, uh, the anterior chamber stays very well formed, and uh, that's also why you don't see much blood egress. And so uh, that is the entire procedure. At this point, you can irrigate out the cohesive viscoelastic, which comes out very... Uh, nicely and uh, typically in one large bolus. And then after hydration, the wounds are then confirmed to be watertight. 
Hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. Thank you for watching. Uh, so that, that eye stent improves the drainage, the outflow. The laser will decrease the production of fluid. So these are the two ways you can decrease the pressure in the eye. Either you produce less fluid using something like the laser or you improve the outflow. Yeah, we can stop the, the videos. Now I'm placing my torque lens and I've lined it up on my 50 second. Uh, so, and this is the second mix that I use. Unfortunately, I didn't find a video I can, but it is, it is a typically a relatively simple thing. We don't open the eye. All what we have is we have uh, one of these probes connected to the laser. So this is the laser ma machine and one of these probes. And we go over the eye around the cornea. And if you remember from the first slide, behind this is the ciliary body. It's that structure that produces the aqueous. So by going over it with the laser, it reduces the production. So you do the upper half, and then you do the lower half. It takes about five minutes, and then that's it. Um, and what we can do and what I'm doing is combining these two together. So I do the laser, then put the eye stent. So decrease the production of fluid with the laser, improve the outflow with the eye stent, and hope that we can control things and avoid the trabeculectomy. All right. So now I can, answer, I can try to answer some questions. <laughs> All right, here's our first one. Um, I didn't really understand what the trabeculectomy was. So trabeculectomy, so what we do is uh, dissect the conjunctiva here, ma make a flap in the conjunctiva and expose the white part of the eye, which is the sclera, okay? And then we make a flap in the sclera, which you see here, the, the surgeon has the flap. He, he's holding it up. And then we make a hole underneath it. So now the fluid in the eye can go from the eye through the hole and out. Okay? But you can't leave things open like this. The pressure will go to zero and that's, that's not good. So you have to put things back in place with, with sutures, so you see one, two, three, four sutures. You put the scleral flap one in place, but that's the trick. You want enough, so you want the fluid to go through, but some resistance. You don't want the fluid to go through freely. So these sutures, you have to sit and tighten and pull and push until you get to that balance. And then you put the conjunctiva back in place and you suture it on both sides. So when you say um, there, there's always, where does the fluid come from? Is your body always producing that? The eye is always producing the fluid. And when it comes out, when it's draining out, it just goes out, out of your eye. In the trabeculectomy, it goes under the conjunctiva. This one, I said there is a bubble. So there will be a kind of a bubble and the fluid is going under the conjunctiva and then it gets absorbed through the blood vessels and goes into the blood. This is a separate question. Can um, the narrow angle glaucoma, uh, is that hereditary or familial? It can be correct, especially people who are farsighted, hyperope. They tend to have a smaller eye, things are more crowded and the anatomy becomes narrower and correct. And as I said, it is much more common in a population like a Chinese population. That's the bigger problem. I have a question. What, what do you see coming down the road? Is there something new out there that you're just waiting for? So several things. So one of them, of course, is... Surgeries like these MIGs improving to the point of lowering the pressure more without becoming more risky and creating side effects. And there is a lot of work. 
uh, on that. Um, medications, there is always a new drug here and there. We have a new drug now. Uh, unfortunately, medication can come with side effects too, redness, allergies, they don't work. Um, neuroprotection. So if we can give you a medication or an eye drop that will prevent your retina from dying, even in the face of high pressure, then that, that's that. So you can have a pressure of 30, but your eyes is, uh, I mean, that's, that's neuroprotection. There is work on that. Nothing that is uh, ready to be used. Uh, these are the, uh, the big trends. Genetics, people working on the genetic uh, and maybe um, uh, uh, trabecular meshwork cellular transplant or stem cell transplant to replace those cells in the meshwork so what's happening is in, in the meshwork, the cells are not working properly, and this is why the pressure goes up. So if you go and put some new and healthy and functioning cells, and then the system can work again. There is work on that too. But And, and is there anything diet-related that can slow things, improve things? Pro something, something what? Um, nutrition, diet-related. Oh, diet. Um, so some, some evidence that, again, those cells in the meshwork are dying because of something. And some evidence is that that something can be an oxidative stress. So taking antioxidants, some people are looking at that too, um, If somebody asks me, it doesn't hurt to take some antioxidants or eat more vegetables. Uh, is there any clear evidence it makes a huge difference? Probably not. Having a healthy lifestyle, if you go and exercise, the pressure tends to be a little bit lower. Um, drinking coffee, if you drink coffee, the pressure tends to go up, but then it goes down. So healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, exercise doesn't hurt. If you do yoga and do a lot of body inversion, that's not good because every time your head is below your body, the pressure in the eye goes up. So especially if you have glaucoma and you do all of these inversion machines and hang from your legs, that's not good. So these are things you can... So you're talking new things because we've never heard any of the docs talk about a good diet or getting exercise, right? Ah, of course. <laughs> Gosh, that seems to be the key theme between all these presentations, right? I just read recently that cannabis might help glaucoma. So that's not recent. Something in cannabis, yes, there is some... Uh, but we have so many other treatments with less side effects. So uh, the, the, the problem with something like cannabis is all the other addictive uh, and other problems. And it doesn't lower the pressure more than other medications. So, but it's, it can be a good excuse to use it. <laughs> you have glaucoma. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then you just don't care that you have it, is what somebody Maybe. commented up Maybe here. Maybe I should prescribe. And it then more. probably the diet goes not so well, right? <laughs> yes, you see lots of stuff. And Tim, are there any questions online? There is a question. Yes, we had oh. one question come in. If a patient has both glaucoma and AMD, does that change the preferred treatment options for glaucoma? No, these are two different things. For glaucoma, again, the only thing we are doing is lower the pressure. Uh, so you have AMD or you don't, the treatment, uh, the management for glaucoma would be the same. All right. And we have another question here. This isn't the question, but it doesn't hurt to eat a lot of carrots, right? <laughs> of, of course. That's what my parents always told me. Well, I've... Yes, I've had high pressures for 
I don't know, I can lose track of time, maybe eight years or something like that. So I I uh, use Lumigan, uh-huh. and I'm pretty sure it's the one of the uh, Ferraris of drugs for <laughs> for your eye because it costs about four dollars a drop if I figure it out right. Correct. But and there are cheaper ones uh, according to my eye doctor, but I said I might as well use the Lamborghini. It's, it is my eyes and. And the insurance pays a lot of it. So, how does that? How does Lumigan work exactly? I have no idea. Well, talking about Ferraris and Lamborghinis, I, I watched the movie Lamborghini: The Man Behind the Legend the other day. Oh, wow. so, <laughs> beautiful movie. So, how does it work? Um, it's it's it improves the outflow of the fluid. Okay. So by, by using Lumigan, the eye is producing the fluid, but you are, you are releasing the, 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 whatever is clogging the system. So there is more fluid going out. There is evidence sometimes it works better than the others. Okay? So sometimes when I try a generic drug, something like Latanoprost, which does the same, and it doesn't work, and I need an extra push, sometimes instead of adding another drop, I try to shift to Lumigan because there is evidence it might work a little bit better. But then you, uh, it becomes an issue with insurance and copays and uh, so, but yes, so I, I, I agree with your uh, ophthalmologist here. There's, I guess you said something that might change the color of your eyes. All these medications, which are the prostaglandin derivatives, <laughs> latanoprost and lumigan, um, if you have, if you are starting with a hazel iris, ten percent of people will tend to have more of a brownish coloration. So it becomes a problem if you are using the drug in one eye and not the other. Then there is a difference, <laughs> but it's it's not a big issue. My wife doesn't worry about it. I guess it's fine. <laughs> I, I was trying to take apart this word, cyclophotocoagulation. Correct. And I just, I, I have no idea how that would work. Uh, <laughs> could you dissect that word for me a little? Well, cyclo, I guess it is for circular. Photo is for light, because we are using a laser. Coagulation is when you kind of cook the tissues, kind of. Okay, so, so this is what we are doing. With the laser, we are, we are treating the ciliary body, which is around the iris here. And we are using the light. This is the photo part. Cycle. So you see the... You see the um, the probe, and this is, this is, imagine the red is the laser light, and it's going down here and kind of damaging this part that produces the fluid. So by damaging that ciliary body, heating it to the point where it dies, or some of it dies, then um, it doesn't produce as much fluid. Okay? So this is, the, now... There is evidence also that this, this technique is improving outflow, but that becomes a bit more complicated. But this is what cyclophotocoagulation comes from. Thank you. Oh, I have a question over here. I'm starting to charge more now. Every question now has become more expensive. <laughs> After you've been to your eye appointment and they've covered all the basic things, uh, do they go beyond the check of the optic nerve to look for glaucoma? If, and if that's good, then uh, they don't go beyond that. Any other checks, or they do all the ones that you mentioned? No, you don't need to do all the other stuff unless you are suspicious of something. Either, either the pressure is higher than what you would like it to be, or uh, you look with the ophthalmoscope, and there is something suspicious, either a hemorrhage or the cup is too large or there is a focal notch. Something should tell you this is, this is a suspicious optic nerve. Family history, 
Once you suspect it is glaucoma, then you go to the next level. Typically, you do an OCT and then a visual field. But if you look and everything is normal, you don't need to go beyond checking the pressure and looking at the optic nerve. Thank you. Any other questions here in person? Here's another one. Same guy, new question. <laughs> At one time, maybe you know, six years ago, I had, I had some light show effect in my eyes. And I've heard that sometimes the optic nerve gets loose or something that has to be reattached. But after, I don't know, a few months, uh, it, the problem resolved itself. I just was curious about that. That's typically not an optic nerve. This is probably what we call a vitreous detachment. So the jelly filling the eye is separating from the retina, and then it creates these flashes. It's a very common thing. Happens one eye, then a few months later happens in the other eye. The, 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 the problem as it is happening, it might, cause, it might cause a retinal detachment, and that needs to be treated. But a vitreous detachment by itself, very common. Tim, any other questions online? Yes, we had one more come in. How progressive is gla glaucoma? Well, it depends on how high the pressure is. Uh, that's the simple answer. So um, very high pressure can cause very rapid deterioration and glaucoma damage can happen very quickly. Within a few weeks, somebody with a pressure of 40 and didn't know, they can come with almost blindness. Uh, if, if things are under observation and pressure is treated and pressure is controlled and there are no other risk factors, then it becomes a very, very slow disease. And that's the goal of the treatment, is to make it slow enough so people live their entire life without losing functional vision. I mean, we, we probably cannot protect everything and make it zero loss, but as long as the loss is slow enough so people have functional vision till the end of their life, that's the goal. So how much vision can you lose and still have functional vision? Well, it depends what you want to do. Okay. <laughs> I want to drive my car and yeah, live independently. So, driving, driving, so glaucoma can be bad. If you are losing peripheral vision, then, yeah, there would be limitations. If you want to fly a plane, there would be limitations. Uh, sitting at home, not very active, I have people who have lost significant amount of vision and they are functional and happy. They, they can are. still be independent at home and... Yeah, now they might need some help with transportation Trans and this and that. But, okay. Uh, so it's a very uh, personal thing. Okay. All my questions are becoming so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on my bill. <laughs> um, does double vision ever go along with glaucoma? Usually not. So double vision is when the eyes are not parallel and focusing on the same thing. So one eye is focusing on something and the other one is focusing on something else, either in or out. That has to do more with the muscles that turn. So instead of the eyes moving together, now one eye is moving separate. Uh, not necessarily, except except if you put a glaucoma drainage implant. If you remember, one of the treatment is to put a drainage implant that can cause double vision. So the treatment causes the double vision, not the glaucoma. I may have to raise the debt ceiling for prime time ah, life's oh, budget let's go to, to DC. afford any let's more. Let's go to White House. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions in, here in the room? Okay, Tim, we're all good online? All good online. All right. Any last things you want to say or are you? No, it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Dr. Hamouche. And thank I you for 
you know, bringing this specialized treatment, you know, we all know how important our vision is, right? And as long as I'm paid. It, it's as long as you're paid. <laughs> yes, yes, we want you to get paid. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And how great that we have this available to us right here in Ames. So thank you, Dr. Hamoush. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please fill out your evaluations and put down ideas for other programs you'd like us to have. Um, our next program isn't really a program. It's a trip we have June 8th, but it's full. It has a long waiting list and has been for several weeks. So I don't want to dwell on that. But our next program here in uh, that we have in the auditorium as well as offered online is Wednesday, June 14th, 2 p.m., an estate planning primer. So please sign up online if you're interested in that. You can drop off your evaluations um, in that wire basket on that back table. And if you would just lay them in there, no need to fold them in half, just go ahead and lay them in there. I would appreciate it. So once again, get out there and thanks for coming and get out there and enjoy the beautiful weather.